everyone. Today I'm talking with Rob Cacuzzo. He's the author of Tracking the Wild Kumba and The Road to San Donato. And he's also the editor of N Magazine. Hi, Rob. Hi there, Tim. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm so happy to be talking with you this afternoon. You hanging in there? I'm, I'm hanging. Yeah, we're doing good. We're me and my little crew. We're we're doing we're doing we're doing well. So uh, missing friends, but I think that we're uh, we're halfway through this battle, hopefully. So yes. looking for the for the light at the end of the tunnel. So I was really excited to talk to you because as friend, we've been friends for a while. But when yep. you're friends with someone that's an author, you don't really sit down and talk to them about their work as as much because usually you know you're just you're at a you're not working. So great. So I wanted to start and ask. Being an editor of N and now an author with two books under your belt, is there a difference to writing a magazine article than writing a book? And is your process different? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I always think of what Russell Baker, an old Nantucket writer, said about writing his column uh, back in the day. And it was that you had to do the ballet in a phone booth. And that's kind of what um, writing an article for a magazine is. You're really confined in the amount of words you can use and the breadth of the story. And then you're also dealing with the opinions of, you know, the, the person you're working for, and then the and then you get your readers in mind and their attention spans and all those things. So there's a big matrix of decisions you need to make in writing an article and, and how it comes out. And as a writer, you always want more words. So there's a huge difference when you transition to writing a book because it's incredibly liberating. With a book, you've got this long journey to to walk. And although when you first kind of endeavor to write a book, it's incredibly daunting. You're looking at a white page, you realize you've got another 250 of those to fill. Um, on the flip side of it is you never get this sense that you can't put something in it. I mean, you might strip it away later on, but the process of lacquering on layers of themes and events and chronology, all the different makeup of a book uh, is for me as a writer, incredibly liberating compared to what I do for the magazine. The magazine, I, I, I'm, I set out with each article to achieve a very specific objective in a, in a short amount of time. So, so the books, would it be safe to say the books are more yours? Like 100%. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that, and that's something I always kind of go back and forth in my, my mind is like, what's my true voice? And I think that the books are definitely my true voice. Not to say that what I write for N Magazine is inauthentic, but I think that when I write for N Magazine, I'm more concerned about serving the readers um, on Nantucket as opposed to when I write my books, I don't necessarily envision the reader. And I know that some authors do, but I just kind of say, oh, this is like my chance to do what I want to do. And, uh, and I do it, you know, and so sometimes it doesn't work and the editor will tell me that. But for the most part, everything I've written in my books for me is like, okay, that's how I want it to come out. Is it hard to switch? Because obviously throughout the year writing the book, you're also writing articles for the magazine right. in one, probably in one day or even yeah. by the hour. So is, is it hard sometimes to get into those zones? You know, I made a good calibration early on when I started writing the book where I was going to treat them as two entirely different things. I would never do one at the same or two at the same time. So for instance, my schedule for writing is I wake up uh, at uh, between four and five every morning and then I work specifically on my books. So from four or five to nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, I'm just working on my book. And then I transition, kind of turn that part of my brain off. And then I focus on N Magazine or whatever articles I'm working on. So it's an entirely different side of my brain. And also as the editor of N, I'm not just writing. Writing for me at, for N is like kind of the hard work. The other part of it is like orchestrating everything with Emmy and Liza and Kit and Brian and my whole team, designer team, my printers. So that's like more of a team effort, um, which is the fun part of it is like going on fashion shoots and all that stuff um, is really enjoyable. Um, so I guess to summarize, I focus on the book stuff. When that's done, I shut that like a game and then I go to my real job, which is, you know, which is Zen. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the road to San Donato. Um, yeah. I loved a lot of things about it, but my favorite thing is probably the father and son dynamic because I yeah. think it's just something that is so into. Well, first of all, can you tell readers that maybe haven't picked this up kind of briefly what it's about? Yeah, so my dad and I uh, cycle across Italy in search of our family roots, family's roots. 
And we do it in honor of my grandfather, who at the time was kind of succumbing to prostate cancer and was at the end of his road. So this trip to our ancestral village was both an opportunity to honor my grandfather and do this uh, trip to basically check off a box in his, um, in his list of things to do in his life that I never got an opportunity to, and then also to do something meaningful with my father. Um, so it was about a 425 mile journey on bikes. We had little backpacks the size of calzones uh, with one pair of clothing and a credit card and just spent two weeks, you know, getting there. And uh, it was a heck of an adventure. <laughs> so the book is dedicated to your daughter because since yeah. you, after you wrote it, you've had a child since then. And it says for Vienna Savoy, while your mother was making you, I was making this. When you look back now, having a kid and that you, this book was about, you know, you and your dad, has anything that you wrote about that dynamic of child and parent changed now that you've had your own child? Yeah, that's such a good question, Tim, because uh, I was writing this as Jenny, my wife was pregnant with Vienna. So I basically set the deadline to finish writing on her due date. And as it turned out, I finished writing and then we had the baby that day, that night. It was this incredible. <laughs> that's a lot in one day. And, and she had the baby on the due date, which is, you know, totally, you know, my, my wife's punctual. Uh, <laughs> so is my daughter, apparently. Um, but to answer your question, you know, it, now that I have a daughter, I have so much more appreciation for, you know, the sacrifices my father made, um, more understanding for the things that I criticized him for. Like, I think that when you realize you know, you throw a kid in the mix, you're suddenly, your, your independence, your time, uh, you know, just the checklist things that you used to have prioritized for yourself is now at the window and you're kind of like third tier in, in life. And so it's a, it's a tough transition to make, you know, and I can appreciate now like the, the certain stresses that my father had raising us um, with whole new eyes. I mean, I just, I, I can see it now and I only have, a, she's only, you know, not even two years old and I can envision the stresses to come. I'm like I, for instance, I think about the parents right now that are teaching their kids in quarantine. And I'm like, I don't know how, like all <laughs> those people should just, they should all be given vacations, yes. like fully paid vacations by the government when all this is done, because we're having a kid where we're just trying to make sure she doesn't put her fingers in light sockets. And, stuff. <laughs> and it's still super stressful, you know? And, uh, so I can, I can, uh, appreciate the sacrifices my dad made for us a lot more. And I, I think that the things that I, again, as I criticized him for, I, um, I feel badly about, I actually feel guilty about. And to be honest with you, when the book was finished and then I had Vienna uh, and I started to really absorb the experience of being a dad and rereading the book, I actually wanted to rewrite a lot of it because I was like, God, I feel terrible about some of the things I wrote in here. Um, and you know, I, I kind of talked to my dad about it and he gave me the greatest gift by saying, you know, as long as it's true, it can stay. And I mean, in this case, a lot of the truth is stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, but I stuck with it and, uh, I'm now kind of moving on to another book and, and I, as long as he's okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Not to turn this negative because, yeah. and I love my father very much, but I could not imagine taking a bike trip with him to Italy. So what, what drove you the most crazy on this trip? <laughs> and I'll do respect to him. No, I mean, listen, I would tell it to his face. Uh, <laughs> no, my dad is, my dad is notoriously frugal. Um, and so there were just moments where we'd be making decisions that, you know, it'd be a matter of a couple dollars and the downside would be enormous. You know, it's like, sharing a bed at a hostel versus, you know, spring an X couple of bucks to have our own beds and we would get the, the joint bed, you know? So he, um, and then the funny thing is as the trip went on, I realized like I am exactly like him. I'm programmed in the same exact way. So I can't bust his chops too much because I'm seeing more and more of myself uh, or him and me. Um, so that was, that was one thing. Uh, you know, the biggest fight that we had was, I mean, you've traveled, so you know this. Um, when you're abroad, you have to adopt a whole new level of patience because 
when you're traveling, like no one cares that you're annoyed about something or that it takes more time to do something or like you're not going to catch your connecting flight, all these things. It's kind of like you're just at the mercy of the travel gods. And so my dad was programmed into this A to B type of travel where when we went on a bike ride, he'd be like, okay, we're going to the destination. And so as someone that's, despite all the traveling I do, I'm, I have a terrible sense of direction and I was the navigator on this trip. So I inevitably got us lost like countless times. I mean, the, the, the trip to the village from Florence should have been about 425 miles. We probably logged about 525 miles from all the times that I'd like send us down the wrong way. And then, you know, and then we'd be sitting at the corner of some, you know, forgotten town trying to figure out where we were. So we had some fights over that, but in time, as everyone experiences when they travel long enough, is that you are forced into that patience and then you end up relishing in it because you just realize, well, that's why I'm here. I'm here to really experience uh, this place without a time clock, without needing to feel rushed to a place. And then, you know, the old truism is, is the case where it's not about the destination, it's about the journey along the way. And so when my dad made that uh, adjustment, it really opened up a world of possibility for us to really uh, enjoy the place and the experience together um, without as many fights. <laughs> <laughs> On the set, you might have already answered it, but what was the most inspiring thing you found out about your dad that, or what made you really reflect back on that and say, wow, I really respect my father for that? Well, physically alone, I was, you know, like we went on this trip and I write in the book, I remember there's a moment where I like had just put my cycling kit on for the first time and I threw my leg over the bar of the bike and I cut a uh, reflection of myself in the car window and I looked like this, like a tube of toothpaste, just like stuffed you know, <laughs> into this cycling kit. Like the fat on my arms and my stomach were like spilling out of this shirt. And I'm like, am I physically ready for this? And I looked over to my dad and here he is like 64 years old. He's got coronary stents in his heart. He's been hit by, as you read in the book, he's been hit by 21 cars. So he's got like all these dings and, you know, broken bones and screws in his ankle and all this business and countless screws loose elsewhere. And we're climbing up these mountains. I mean, literally the, the, the climbs on this cycling trip would just, they would go on and on and on and on forever. And it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. I remember the first day and looking back at him and I just thought, like he could literally die right now. I mean, he's got this, I could just picture his old heart. It was like a little coin purse, you know, it's getting stuffed with pennies, you know, until eventually it's gonna like whoosh, explode. And so I didn't know if he'd survive. And what remarkably happened was he ended up getting stronger as I gradually fell apart. Like my body started falling apart. I was just, just a piece uh, of junk at the end of the trip. And he was just this strong, sprightly guy who would crank through these 100-mile days uh, without flinching. And so I was definitely impressed by his physical ability. Um, and then when we were downtrodden, we had some moments where we didn't think we'd be able to recover. He was there to really lift us up at a time when we needed most. And uh, I read about that, obviously, extensively in the book. <clears throat> So I, um, I read it a couple of years ago when it came out, but then I was kind of rereading it to prep for this interview. And it's a great book for right now for anyone to pick up because traveling really isn't an option for anyone. And this yeah. really is a travel adventure. Yeah. Um, is there another place, do you have a top 10 bucket list, I guess, of places that you'd like to visit? And then I'd love to know some of them. And then I was wondering if there's a book in any of those places. Yeah. Um... You know, my number one place that I'm dying to go to is India. Uh, I've just always been, you know, intrigued by India. Jenny and I went to Nepal for our honeymoon and kind of just got a, you know, a distant smell of it. You know, we, we really were kind of drawn to, we've, we've both been really drawn to wanting to do that. So that's, that's like number one. I can honestly say that I don't have much beyond my purview wanting to do that because I've been fortunate enough to go to a lot of places. So I'm usually a person that like, you know, when I eat food, I eat every, like I'll eat all the French fries first and then I'll eat the steak and then I'll, I eat one at a time. Mm -hmm. So right now the, the thing I'm looking to dive into is India, but I've never been to Africa. So that's next on my list. Um, there's just so many places. Um, as far as where a book could be, um, I, my first kind of um, experience writing was my first real travel alone experience. I went to South America for four months by myself and just backpacked around Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. And um, my dream is to one day go back with Vienna 
and go to the, because I wrote extensively along the way. I wrote a whole blog that just became a, kind of my first real piece of writing. And I wanted it to be a book, but it just didn't have the substance for a full length book. So my goal is someday to go back with Vienna and like go back to all those places and then have the book kind of go from my reflections when I was, you know, 20 years old, 21 years old, whatever I was, to this experience seeing it with my daughter and then kind of writing about being, writing about what the place looks like now compared to what it was. And then also my own kind of experience with my kid who's, sorry, it sounds like she's crying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what a great sequel to kind of this one that is, Thanks. you know, I mean, I love that correlation there. Thanks. Yeah, no, it could be really cool. I, I, uh, I hope that day will come soon. I mean, Jenny and I have talked about wanting to live abroad for a, um, a chunk of time. And um, we were actually, between you and me and everyone watching this, we were planning, <laughs> on, <laughs> we were planning on doing that um this coming winter and uh given the circumstances you know we actually had a conversation about last night we're like now nah, can we do this you know is this going to be feasible um so jury's still out but we have every intention of living abroad for a chunk of time because i feel like it'd be really cool to to do that with her you know with yeah. vienna yes um so we'll see so each chapter of the book has a quote um that begins it. And I love them all. A lot of them have to do with travel and, and reading and writing. Do you have a favorite literary quote? You know, I was thinking about that. And um, the one that keeps on coming to mind is, and I can't, I was looking for it because I, I've since paraphrased it in my brain and exists in my brain. Um, and this is a quote that really changed my life um, because I was early on in my career, I was living in Jackson Hole and I was like, ah, can I be a writer? You know, do I have what it takes to be a writer? Blah, blah, blah. And I was reading The Perfect Storm by Sebastian Younger. He's like this, my, my hero be, has become my hero. And um, he writes in, I believe, the, uh, it's either in the afterword or the preface, this idea that the job of a writer is, is not to kind of, at least a nonfiction writer, is not to really direct the story so much as to ask a lot of questions and then just follow where they go. And let the people that you... Uh, that you're talking to tell their own story, you know, and I think that as it relates to my journey as a writer, that's kind of my whole thing is I ask questions and I listen. I listen more than I talk. And sometimes I'll even I'll be listening back to the recordings of all these people I've interviewed for some of the books I've written. And like I will talk 2% of the whole tape. And I ask myself, like, well, you know, what am I actually doing here? You know, I'm just I'm just listening. But I think that what my you know, I think what my, my, I don't want to say skill set, but what, what, why I'm a writer is because I love stories. I love hearing people tell stories. And I can just, like, when I hear someone tell a story, I go into the, you know, I go right in, you know, and I'm there. And it becomes kind of, it seeps into my essence. And then my job is just to kind of, you know, share it with other people. Um, so that's my that's number cool. one. I, I think I've said this to you several times, but it's the number one thing I respect the most about you is that, and you don't realize that a lot of people don't have this in them, but you really do. Even if it's uh, someone telling the dumbest story, you are very invested in what that person is saying. And you are oh, very, awesome. you pretend that they are the only person in the room. And I think that's a really rare quality. And a lot of people, a lot of people say that about you, that you're, it's just very, like well, I was talking to Rob Cuso and he just really just looks into your eye and really listens. And I think it, when you notice someone doing that, I think it's because a lot of people don't. Well, oh, thank you, Tim. That's, that's, I, that's really kind of you to say. And uh, yeah, I mean, I always feel, um, I don't know. It's a, I think it's just a curiosity and um, you know, for me too, listening is a way to kind of slow it down because um you know, so often we're always kind of trying to think of what's going to come next, you know, and I often catch myself in conversation where I'll be like, where's my head right now? You know, like just focus on what, what's in front of you, you know, yeah. like don't, cause, cause we're all like, you know, we're all getting drawn every other way. And, um, you know, one of the things I've been trying to do in this whole quarantine time is to implement meditation into my life. And, uh, it, <laughs> it is a tough, it's a tough thing, you know, because when you sit down and try to, center your mind it's amazing how all the trains you start seeing the trains and how fast they're going all the time you know and for me conversation is like breath i can actually 
like lock into something and, and kind of shut everything else out. So, so I've heard from a lot of fiction, maybe more fiction that they sit down to write a book and it doesn't turn out to be anything like they thought it would be. Can the same be said for the two books you've written? Like, did you sit down and say, I'm going to write The Road to San Nato and it's about a bike trip with my dad and examining the family history. And did it turn out that you, um, yes, the book was still about that, but maybe you gathered something that you did not plan on? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Both books, um, you know, when I set out to write them, uh, the process of writing yielded something I wasn't even remotely thinking about exploring. I mean, I think for... The Road to San Donato was never intending on writing about my own mental health issues or, you know, like I just don't really talk about generally. And, uh, and then I realized like through these conversations with my father that like these are relevant topics for readers. And I think that as a writer, your job is to like share enough vulnerability, uh, at least as it relates to nonfiction, to gain the trust of your readers. And what I've found is when you put out those things about yourself that are uncomfortable and the things that are most vulnerable to you, you gain so much from that from your readers. I've had more people reach out to me about things that I put out there like, oh, God, I don't know if this is the right thing to, you know, include. And yet uh, more often than not, people are having those same thoughts. And that is ultimately what I think my job is, is to put out, I don't know, a story that someone can connect to that might be alone and uh, you know, might be needing to know that they're not alone. And, um, you know, when I was writing about my own depression and anxiety issues, um, you know, there were people in my life that I knew were going through that themselves. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, I can't just like gloss over this and not share it because maybe this person will read this and they'll say, well, I, just, I never thought he had that same type of challenge, you know? Yeah. And um, well, I think that's what makes the book so special um, because anyone can write a travel guide or a travel adventure book, but yeah. to make it personal and lay, you know, really your, um, your life on the page like that is what is going to appeal to people and really. Yeah. Make it out. yeah I mean, will I do it again anytime soon? <laughs> I'm probably going to take my time. I'll probably <laughs> write about my family anytime soon. Uh yeah, I mean, it's so funny because Jenny and I have this conversation all the time, like, well, wow, you know, what are we going to do next? What do you, you know, what are we, what are me, what am I going to write? And um, it's tough to say. I and mean, I think that when I'm ready to write again, I'll be willing to go to that place again. But for the most part right now, I'm just like, yeah, I kind of want to stay in the third person for a little bit, yeah. you know, and not put myself out there too much right now. But, so I read... Um... I'm gonna have to read this one a little bit. Yeah. I've read Danny Shapiro's Inheritance a few, maybe like yeah. last year. And it's about Danny finding out that through a genealogy website that her biological father was not her father. And yeah. I was, the, the book shocked me because I couldn't even imagine having gone through that. And since San Donato, the Road to San Donato is so much about family history, do you, I guess I'm really interested in your opinion on what constitute identity and family history and if it would have changed your whole narrative if you would have found out that you were biologically not related to the history you were examining yeah that's such a great question um yeah i mean i think that identity is is, is sewn into how you um how you tell your own story you know, and what truths you've identified for yourself as being kind of the touchstones that are the core of your identity. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a part of the book where um, we finally got to this village and we discovered this really harrowing history that took place during World War II in which the village was kind of split between Nazi sympathizers and heroes that were saving the lives of these Jews that were interned there. And when I first learned about this history, I didn't know which side of the fence my family was on. And I thought, yikes, like I'm about to marry a Jewish woman. <laughs> if we find out that we were part of these like fascist sympathizers, what does that do for my sense of self and my identity? And I still grapple with what I would have done. I mean, obviously I'm not, this isn't a big spoiler, but we're not, we're, we weren't part of those sympathizers, uh, my family. But I think that we all have to come to peace with 
where our family history brought us, you know? And I think that you and I were all the result of generations of our family members basically making a decision to right a wrong in our past, you know? Like there was, there was something that was, um, I mean, I just look, I can only use my own family's kind of history as an example, but you know, my grandfather uh, had a terrible relationship with his father. His father was just like abusive alcoholic and just treated my grandfather so poorly. So when my grandfather had my dad, like he made sure to nurture him and like surround him with all this love and protection, you know, but one of my grandfather's shortcomings was that he didn't believe in education. So he didn't like really, um, encourage my dad to go to college and made it really hard for him. And my dad always kind of resented that. So when he had me, like education was boom, like you want to go anywhere, I'm paying for every single dollar for you to go. Um, and so now I look back at my own dad and I'm like, all right, well, what am I doing now when I have my kid? Like how, what right am I, what, what's the, the goodness that I'm bringing forward and what's the, the correction I'm making? Um, so that's how I think we have to deal with our family is like, we're just, we're part of this cause and effect. You know, we're not defined by the flaws of our forefathers. Um, we're just the greatest that's kind of rising to the surface. And as long as you're willing to go back and um, glean the goodness from each of those generations, uh, then I think that you can be proud of any history you're from. Yeah. I love that. Have you determined what yours with Deanna is the, thing you're trying to not do and do? Uh, it's such a tough question. I, I mean, she, she's still so young. I feel like maybe that comes with age. Yeah, I think that if one thing, like my dad was always a big risk taker, um, as you read about in the book. And yeah, I've looked back at some of the risks I've taken um, in pursuing some of my projects and I think I'd probably take the foot off the gas a little yeah. bit uh, moving forward. But um, I haven't. I haven't. I mean, I just want to be the best dad I can be. I want to be there and invested. And, um, you know, I look back at what my dad did for me and I was so fortunate to like experience so much with him and, um, still, I still am, you know, we still do a lot together. So there's plenty for me to, to bring forward, bring from that relationship. And there's, um, there's a few things to correct, but <laughs> nothing too dramatic. <laughs> So we, I mentioned this before, but you're a great interviewer for the magazine and for um, just even at the book festival when you interview authors. I guess my question to you is what would the interviewer Rob ask the writer Rob? I'd probably ask him, are you serious with that haircut? <laughs> <laughs> I know, pretty soon my hair is gonna be as long as yours. Your hair point. looks phenomenal. I was like, God, where's this guy getting his cut? No, and my dad's a, a wig. I, I ordered a wig and then I just put it on before these things. <laughs> you got like the, you get the cap, the uh, skin cap, and then you put the wig on. It's, yeah, it's perfectly coiffed exactly how I want it to look and put it on. It's brilliant. Um, I think that if I were to ask myself a um, question that would yield an interesting answer, um, I would actually probably ask the question that you asked about, um, you know, the unexpected kind of gifts that come along the journey. Like I, I, I was thinking about when I set out to write my first book and it was going to be this adventure story. You know, it was, I want to read about a ski hero, you know, that did these extreme things. And as I was writing that book, I had this crazy experience where I started actually feeling connected to this guy in a way in which, if I needed something, some critical part of the story, it would magically arrive on my doorstep. So like literally, I remember, for instance, I was looking for this piece of information about his childhood and it took me three months to figure out like where this information was. And I finally found it and I knew exactly where it was. It was in his sister's home in Vermont. And so I sent her an email um, saying like, this is, I remember seeing this at your house, you know, do you mind shipping it over to Boston for me? And I sent the email and I went out to go get, a, get on my bike to get some exercise. And there was a package on my doorstep and it was from his sister with the exact thing that I needed. Wow. And that happened at least 10 times throughout the experience of writing the book. And so as I was writing the book, I just found this whole thing to be way too profound, not to include it. And so I started writing about it in this, in this, you know, kind of unexpected way. 
Um, so I'm not sure what that would be as a question, but I think that it's, you know, one of those unexpected, you know, experiences that occur when you endeavor on writing a book. Yeah. Um, as far as your, with being the editor of N, you've probably come into a contact with a lot of different people and we can all admit right now the world is, no matter which side you're on, we're pretty divided. And you probably interview a lot of people that maybe don't exactly hold true to what your convictions in life are or viewpoints. I guess as someone that does listen to both sides, which I think one of the, um, like I was talking with author Jody Peacote and she said the number one thing we need to do in order to get back together is listen to each other. And since when I thought of interviewing you, I was like, he is the number one listener. So how, what is your opinion of after we listen, what is the next step? to build a country and a world that we kind of unite instead of separate? I mean, I think part of listening is pulling back and, um, you know, understanding or trying to understand where a lot of people's opinions come from and what they're the product of. You know, one of the biggest revelations I had recently, it's just like one of these things that's like stupid reality, but when you think about it, it it's kind of mind blowing. I was thinking about how the people on the other side of the political spectrum believe what they believe just as fervently as I believe what I believe, meaning they see it as truth. So when I look at, when I look at what they're looking at, what they're believing, I'm like, that is ridiculous. You know, you are, you are like misinformed, you know, and I, and I, and I, prior to this revelation, I thought, you know, that that's a lie and yet you're continuing to push it. But in reality, those folks actually believe that to be true. Just as I believe my whole kind of spiel. Yep. So the question then becomes, how do we understand why they think that's true? You know, and what are the, what are the circumstances that brought them to that conclusion? And I, I have to admit that I'm not, I might be a great listener, but it doesn't mean that I understand. Um, I have a, I have a hard time, um, with a lot of the things that are happening right now and a lot of the opinions are happening and the selfless selfishness, um, the closed mindedness. And I wish I had a, an answer because it's, it feels very discouraging. And, um, my hope now is that we've had this once in a, I mean, generation, once in a mankind kind of uh, experience. Um, and I hope that when we can finally come up for air, we can start saying, oh, you know what? We need to figure this out a little better because at a time when we were meant to come together closest, um, you know, there were those that were holding out and um, we need to raise up the folks that are acting with such selflessness and heroism. And they're the exemplars for our society, you know? And um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, Tim, I, I wish I had a better answer. Um, well, I mean, there is, I mean, I think it's, it's something to discuss, but there is no answer. I mean, <laughs> and that's what's, I guess, um, what's hard about it, because it's like, what are the, what are the steps? But I do think yeah. listening is the first one, because a lot yeah. of people don't even have that to be able to do. Yeah, I mean, I think that if we could just listen and not be, we're all, and myself included, we're all kind of like ready to, ah! you yep. know, I'm going to bounce on you, you know, and it's not productive. You know, let's like put a little air in it. This, it just feels like there's no air, right? Yeah. It feels like there's no room for kind of like, everything is so, everyone's so vested and there's no like, there's no, I don't know. I mean, it's just like everyone's playing for keeps, you know? There's a difference between listening and hearing. Like you can listen to somebody, but are you hearing them? A hundred percent, dude. That is exactly right. It's so true. I mean, it's so true. Um, are you working on anything right now? You know, one of the things that I do, uh, I'm not writing my own book right now, um, but one of the things I've been doing between books is I work with private clients um, and I write their biographies for them exclusively and for their family. So um, I'm working on one of those right now, which has been really rewarding. Um, you know, these are folks that just want to have their stories recorded for their family history. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times these are just, you know, pioneers of industry, innovators, um, really fascinating individuals that I work with for a year 
and I'll interview them once a week. And then I write a book, uh, basically a biography on their lives. And it's strictly for their family. So no one reads it. I, and it's, I'll tell you that one of the rewarding things that's come out of it for me is that not only am I getting these this crazy kind of MBA from just interviewing some, you know, uh, 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 remarkable individuals, um, but it's reaffirmed why I do this. I'm writing, like with this, these projects, I'm writing books that will never see the light of day, that only about 20 copies will be ever printed. And yet I'm so satisfied in writing them because I just love to write and tell stories. You know, it's not about like the, like I, I don't really like the other stuff. I don't like going on book tours. I mean, I like it, but I, it's not like why I do it. You know, like it's, it's, it's certainly a thrill to do that type of thing, but it's definitely not why I do it. I mean, I, that's part of what I have to do to try to be successful at this. And I'm still learning how to do that. I mean, it's, I think that's one of the hard things. And that's why I have such admiration for like some of the authors that you've featured already. They've, they've figured that out, you know, and then one of the messages I've continued to drill into my head is like, if you're going to work so hard to write a book, you know, when no one's watching, like you got to work just as hard to promote it and like be out there and cultivating a following and all that stuff. Uh, I'm still learning how to do quite frankly. So these other projects I do are really, really gratifying for me because I can just like, my whole goal is just write this person's story. Yeah. You know? And that's well, it. Especially with social media and book tours these days. I mean, the writer's job almost begins at publication. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my dude, oh, that's exactly right. It's so true. And I, and I have such admiration for people that can like keep that engine going. I mean, I got to be honest here. It's hard for me to write, talk about my books at this point. And I haven't even done like the real, you know, Cadillac book tour. You know, I've done just like the regional thing for this particular book. So it's tough. I mean, I think that you need to have uh, a resiliency and, and an understanding like that's your job. Yeah. No one's going to ring the bell or, 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 if, or if, if no one's going to ring the bell for you, like you got to tell people that it's here. You know, at some point, like you, you gain your own momentum and, but you know, look at some of the people that you've, you've, you know, you've featured so far, like these people, they work hard. Yeah. I'm like Ellen and Nat, like they work hard. Maybe. And these are people that can like literally just, I mean, from my perspective as like someone that's like clawing his way up, you know, they could, in my perspective, be like, oh, just ship the book off, you know, move on to the next. But they're, they're, they're out there and they're yeah. grinding. And so I look at what they do and I think, you know what, if these people who are my heroes are out there grinding like that, like I got to be grinding just as hard, probably harder, you know, and uh, so I'm still learning how to do that, quite frankly. Well, you're doing a great job. Wow, thanks, buddy. Okay, we'll wrap up here, but I'm going to do my favorite part is a speed round. You yeah. ready? You got it. Okay. Favorite book as a kid? Uh, the, I'm sorry for all these things. Uh, Lion, Witch, the Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis. Loved it. I actually have a copy of it. I think I have the original copy. Yeah, I do. Got the original copy right here. Yes. With the binding all taped up. I read the, read the pages off this bad boy. And I, oh, and look at, I haven't opened this up in for ages. I know it's supposed to speed run, but I get it all, the, the underlined, the, you know, the things underlined that I love. I loved that. What was your, is the, in that series, did you have a second favorite? Uh, I was like Prince Caspian was another one I really liked. Um, I liked the whole thing, but this was yeah. definitely my, my favorite. Um, yeah, I remember, it's so funny because that, that time in my life, I remember like where I was when I was just devouring these books and um second favorite was the hatchet um gary paulson i think um, was another good one favorite book you love to read to your child vienna so my daughter is a like a total book junkie she loves loves books you know she calls them bookies <laughs> um so she, her, her the one her jam right now is this book by uh, ryan t higgins uh it's called bruce's big storm and I actually, I, the reason I got this book is I was at a book talk with this guy and uh, we got to chat and we we're both like, same thing. We we're just like, God, this stuff sucks. You know, <laughs> like just like the, you know, doing the book stuff. It, it doesn't all suck, but just like, it's exhausting. And so he and I were kind of like huddled in a corner and uh, he's this uh, illustrator from Vermont and is a children's book author. And uh, he came to the Boston Book Festival and I ended up see, 
bringing Vienna to see him read books. And uh, so he signed one for her and she loves it. It's like, it was all full of animals and stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. Favorite travel guide or travel book? So I would say uh, I don't believe in travel guides just because I've, you know, when I first started traveling, I, uh, I was in South America and I, I was carrying my lonely planet like it was the Bible and actually funny quick story about it. So I was like, I was by myself and I read in the travel, the travel guide that there's this nude beach, like, you know, West, you know? So I was like, oh, I'm going to the nude beach. So I got on a bus and I was on the bus for hours and hours, like a sweaty stifling bus show up no nude beach <laughs> so I was like from that point forward, I was like no I'm not carrying this around me anymore um so my favorite travel uh book would probably be um Paul Thoreau like the Great Railroad Bazaar uh, he's just the man uh, all the stuff the, the Patagonia Express and all those things Bill Bryson is another great one um you know those are the you know travel writers that I aspire to at some point I just read Bill Bryson's the Australia one because oh we- in a suburb country and I was like, why are we going here? Everything <laughs> that can kill you is in, is in this country. Yeah, yeah that, that is such a good one. He's, I mean, he's hilarious. Favorite novel? I mean, I want to say like Hemingway is probably in the, you know, in terms of like my favorite stuff, like uh, uh, Island of the Stream is one of my favorite ones. But I also love, like when I'm reading novels, it's usually like beach reads. So um you know, like I love the Da Vinci Code and stuff like that. Like I love just kind of like cinematic novels. Um, I'm, I gotta be honest that I'm a nonfiction guy like through and through. So I probably read one novel a year. Um, so that's what I got. Favorite memoir? Uh, again, this is my genre. I love memoirs. So it's a tough one to choose. I'm between, um, I love Stephen King's on writing, um, which is kind of two part book. You know, you get this real amazing insight on this, you know, literary genius um, and just how hard it was for him clawing his way to the top. And then he also supplements that book with these incredibly informative pieces of advice about being a writer. Um, I mean, Stephen but, King, look, this whole row. I, so do you, I, so you, you've read that, I assume, on writing? <laughs> on writing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, isn't it great? I mean, it's, it's like. It's fantastic. I mean, I think like people look at Stephen King if you don't really know, and he is just, he's a really, really outstanding writer. I mean, his success was well-deserved. It wasn't. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah, exactly. Success was so well-deserved. I mean, I always think back to the scene that he writes about um, in his early days where he would be in his kitchen, like sitting at this little makeshift desk and getting rejection letters. And it's like putting them on a spike on his refrigerator. And they would be like, the whole spike would be, you know, rejection letters and um and then also just the twists and turns of his life i mean when he gets hit by the car like all of it i mean it's such a compelling read imagine being the person that rejected stephen king oh my god (laughs) i don't know if i could show my face it's literally like pete best who got kicked off the beatles right before they took ringo (laughs) star on you know yeah Uh, and then i did i do want to say honorable mention would probably be david sedaris i think his work is like you know in terms of people that make me laugh i just the guy is a genius yeah Yeah. um you have a favorite movie jaws easy love that definitely my favorite movie as a kid um this is a new one that i'm trying with the writers and it's you're just to make people laugh it's just for fun so it's going to be your stripper name which is your first pet and the street you grew up on so what is that yeah so my stripper name would be maggie epping which would be an interesting one. I guess Epping's like a really good stripper last name. Man, um, yeah. Favorite place? Uh, I'm torn between Mattaket, which has always held a real big chunk of my heart. Um, you know, when I first came to Nantucket, I was a fisherman and I used to run a boat out of um, Jackson Point Pier in Mattaket Harbor. Um, so I've always felt deeply connected to that. Um, Mattaket. And then also where we are in Jackson, New Hampshire, there's a little river behind my house that I whenever I walk down there, I just, I feel like, wow, this is like my point on earth. Like this is where the vortex is for me, you know, and I feel deeply connected to that. So those two locations. And what are you reading right now? Um, so I'm reading, um, see Eric Larson's The Splendid in the Vile, mm. uh, which I think is pretty fitting for right now. You know, talk, it's, as you probably know, it's you know, written during World War II, just getting bombed uh, to smithereens by the Nazis for like 45 straight days and how Churchill, you know, rose up to be an incredible leader during that time. 
Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I know where the world is zoomed out maybe, but I really appreciate it. And I think oh, this is great. So thank you. Yeah, man. I love you, man. I'm so proud of you for doing this. It's such a great service for our community and everything that you guys are doing, uh, you. you know, keeping us all culturally vibrant at a time when we need it most. So uh, you have my sincere appreciation. And thank, thank you very much. Including. Oh, of course. Always. Well, thank you very much. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Bye, man. Yeah.